Hi, and welcome to the March episode of Spotlight on UNBC. My name is Rob Van Adderkum, and coming up on the program this month, we have the scoop on some new teaching technology. We have footage from a student workshop on the future of the BC Park system, and we'll find out whether BC really needs to expand its university system. But first, highlights from a student protest on the cost of attending university. All that and more is coming up on this episode of Spotlight on UNBC for March 1998. Attending university is a costly proposition. There's a lot of research to support claims that getting a university degree is actually a really good personal investment. But the fact remains that a four-year bachelor's degree is worth about $12,000 for tuition and books alone. As a result, many students rack up hefty student loans, and a recent student protest was held to bring attention to the cause. It's a reality for many students despite the fact that tuition fee freeze has been in place for the past few years. About 45% of all UNBC students get a student loan and the average loan is nearly $7,000 per student. How many people here have loans to pay? <laughs> Should we have these loans? Paying back those loans is a major issue, and the federal government is implementing a repayment plan that is income contingent. If you're rich, you get a nice, easy, uh, payable education there, but if you're poor, the education's gone out. No, just a minute. Your, your definition of that is wrong. What we support is that the repayment of your student loans should be based on, on your ability to earn an income when you get into the workforce and how much you can earn. So the, so the income contingent plan that the federal government is now considering is uh, not a stretched out thing with interest added on over a 10 to 25 year period? No, 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 absolutely no, not. I think the cost of attending university was also addressed in this year's federal budget when the federal government announced the huge Millennium Scholarship Program. Today, we are announcing the largest single investment ever made by a federal government to support access to post-secondary education for all Canadians. Millennium Scholarship Foundation, a private, independent institution, is being created. The government will provide the foundation with, with an initial 10-year endowment of $2.5 billion. Bravo. As a private foundation, it will be able to receive donations and bequests from across the country. Mr. Speaker, this investment will provide over 100,000 scholarships to low- and middle-income students each and every year over the course of the next year. The announcement is clearly significant, but it remains to be seen if it will make demonstrations like this a thing of the past. For a university with a regional mandate like UNBC, technology can make the difference between delivering the goods or not. The infrastructure exists at UNBC to take advantage of new teaching technology, and a recent contribution from BC Gas will allow even further development. The new system will allow students almost anywhere to take classes by computer, but this new technology takes interaction a big step further than it has ever seen in the past. Students will now actually be able to hear the lecture and ask questions exactly as if everyone was in the same room. In addition, professors will be able to share lecture notes or other online information on the computer monitor. UNBC has been able to acquire the equipment through a $50,000 donation from BC Gas. I'm very impressed with uh, how user-friendly it is and uh, 
I think it's going to be just great. I think it's going to provide an enormous resource to uh, uh, parts of British Columbia which perhaps don't have access to uh, uh, facilities such as the university here. What we're doing with this technology is we're integrating voice and uh, data or bringing together the World Wide Web with audio so that a, a student can now take a course looking at their uh, TV or their monitor, their computer monitor, and talking and hearing a professor. Uh, the other thing that does is, uh, because of its cost effectiveness, is it allows us to move beyond delivering to the larger community. We've been delivering uh, to the major centers in northern British Columbia from our inception to the present day, and we've offered quite a number of courses to quite a number of students that way, but we haven't been able to reach very small communities where there's only one learner or two learners. This is the technology that will allow us to do that now. And the, uh, the uh, promise of home delivery of, uh, of education is actually becoming a reality with this, uh, with this new technology. Over the past couple of years, UNBC has been devoting much effort towards using technology like the World Wide Web for course delivery. And the experts admit it's the right way to go. Michael Clark is a professor from the University of Western Ontario and he has helped pioneer the development of the web as a teaching tool. He visited UNBC recently and believes the opportunity exists here for major development. This to me is the perfect match um, between the technology and your educational mandate. Um, the health sciences program here is ideally suited to that sort of thing. In, an, in addition to that, teacher support um, is, is also ideally suited to this. Uh, because teachers are actually using this technology in their classes now, um, it fits. And, and so I, I think UNBC is in a, a particularly unique position, actually, um, to take advantage of this for regional um, educational experiences for, for people who, for professional development. Technology allows UNBC to expand its course offerings and make them available throughout the North, but what about expansion of the overall BC University system? A recent report by a UBC professor has found that a viable BC economy will need a tripling of the annual number of BC University graduates. Robert Allen's uh, report says uh, that we're not expanding fast enough to meet the labour market demand. He, his report also, I think, uh, underlines the fallacy of an argument that was made a couple of years ago which seemed to imply that uh, that the government should be expanding places in colleges and not in universities because that's where the the real demand for skills uh, were and uh, his findings say that uh, no we're meeting the demand labor market demand in those areas is for the higher level skills those uh, that are provided to students who do university where the province is really falling short for example, the report points out that the unemployment rate for university grads has always been lowest, but since the 1970s, the demand for university graduates has risen the most. UNBC can address part of that demand, but the new report shows that the overall BC university system must expand more. We are here to educate, we are here to train people, we are here to give them uh, uh, wonderful opportunities in life, uh, the kind of opportunities that education opens uh, for them but we're also here to serve as a catalyst to, uh, to foster economic development in the region, to foster cultural uh, growth, to foster social development, to improve the quality of life. I mean, all those things are why we are here, and we work on a broad front. And to the extent that universities do those things and do them well, they're absolutely essential institutions within, within our modern society. A group of UNBC students put on a timely workshop last month on the future of the BC Park System. The event was focused on the new Northern Rockies protected area and included discussion on the viability of a tourism and parks based economy. In this province, British Columbia, the whole foundation of the province has been based on industry as, as far as I can see and it'd be a sad day to think that we could do without it. Neil Mayer was one of the panelists in this discussion of the BC Park System. The experts debated the role of a growing network of parks and how those parks could thrive in a province where resource extraction has always been king. The Northern Rockies area was selected as the case study partly because it's a protected area, which also includes regions for so-called sensitive development. 
Wayne Sawchuck is a key proponent for the Northern Rockies. Issues around uh, impacts of uh, industrial development on wilderness areas, I think there's a, an area of research there that uh, we have a perfect opportunity to study because we have basically pristine areas that the LRMP has said it will be open for sensitive development in the future. That should be monitored and I think UNBC certainly is one of the, the organizations that's well positioned to do that. Enter the new UNBC Northern Land Use Institute, now being overseen by Professor Bob Pfister. Part of it is going to require partnerships, public-private, and we've had some initiatives in that regard with uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series and talking to public agencies with new initiatives such as the uh, Muskoka Chica, the uh, brand new Northern Rockies area. Uh, these special management areas are going to require planning as well as research assistance, and it's a wonderful opportunity for the Northern Land Use Institute to uh, do some uh, outreach activities uh, with university faculty and, and their gradu graduate students. So I would see us having a, a increased presence, hopefully working with a new faculty position. We're going to have uh, uh, dealing with oil and gas in the, in the Northeast and, uh, and be able to just uh, take our research capability out into the region and uh, help in specific ways, and especially rural communities that have uh, certainly all the planning problems that larger communities do, but maybe less access to the uh, technical assistance and so forth. Many of the small northern towns that Bob Pfister refers to depend on natural resource industries, but there's increasing pressure for developing both parks and tourism opportunities in the great outdoors. I think it's important to note that, it, that those values are there and they should be recognized and there should be some form of a partnership that uh, looks at, at parks as, as, as a partnership for all of us to enjoy, including people that work in the industries, but uh, they should not be looked at as replacing those industries. We should look at more of a partnership. We need a forest industry, we need a mining industry, and we need a fisheries industry. The question that we have to answer is how do we make them sustainable? A UNBC geography professor has been inviting local elementary school students to think about landscape issues a little closer to home. This, this Greg Halseth has overseen symbols. this year's Kids Map program, and which so is encouraging students to map the places in their community that important. are important to them. The program the, has seen huge growth this year. Maps. In fact, up to 1,000 students from about 20 goodness, schools are map. taking part. Yeah. The maps would be great to display in the new Prince George Art Gallery, construction of which will likely begin this year. UNBC employees and students are taking part in the fundraising campaign, which is being overseen by a UNBC student. The one thing that's good about working for a small organization like the Art Gallery is you don't have anybody above you, which is a beautiful thing about co-op because it puts you into uh, some of these positions where you really do get a great deal of responsibility. So I get to meet uh, community leaders, business people, and deal one-on-one. -on -one. And it's sort of, you don't feel like a student, even though you're still going to school. Um, when you work for a group like the Art Gallery, you really feel like you're a part of the organization. I think the development of a new art gallery in Prince George will definitely help to develop the cultural aspect of the city and deserves the strong support of the university. How much money are you trying to raise? We're hoping to, to raise uh, $10,000. Once we're in the new space, I really see it as being a partnership that'll just grow in the future. Um, we'll have lots of space in the new gallery where people like the UNBC um, community will be able to come for meetings, or uh, you know, I can see the film series expanding. And I'm also a member of the UNBC Arts Council, so there's already a, a lot of connection between the gallery and the and the university. And I just see that as growing as the as the interest in, in visual art grows. Art is only one way to describe the button blankets made famous by West Coast Aboriginal groups. Nearly 40 UNBC students and faculty have been participating in a button blanket making workshop over the past several weeks. The first time we did it and I saw all the students on all those sewing machines, I thought, oh my God, I wonder if we can do it. <laughs> but we did, this is the third one and we're all rolling along nicely. The blankets are really going to be spectacular when they're all done. And these are real traditional blankets with the real, like from the first Hudson Bay traders that brought us the melting cloth, and that's what this material is. And then the real shell buttons, they'll have real shell buttons on them. Workshop leader Marion Hunt Doig is an Order of Canada recipient and herself the maker of about 50 button blankets. Nearly 40 UNBC students and faculty are taking part in the project, including members from a variety of First Nations groups. 
Wow. See, the old designs were strong. They were, yeah, this is a strong design. Don't take too much cut out. Don't cut out too much, and then it's traditional. It's uh, like a personal identity. Yeah. It's like your own fingerprint. This is my blanket, it's my design, and my frog plan. And I'm really proud of it. So. It's, uh, it's a really interesting project. I've learned lots. And uh, there's a lot of um, little protocol in making your clan blankets yeah. too. Like you can't take somebody else's design and use it on yours. And um, you have to have your specific clan design. Like, like I said, the frog is mine. I think I'm going to do um, partially a feather design, which is kind of a little bit pan-Indian, I guess you'd call it. And um, my heritage is um, Plains Cree, so it's sort of away from the West Coast, but I still want to incorporate some of the West Coast um, elements of the design in it just to stay true to the origins of the tradition and the art. So. When they're finished, they're going to have a picture in their mind of what we've done today, you know, what we're doing, and they're going to take it with them. There's another little girl here that's right in there with her mother, mom's design, doing her own design, and um, she's going to take this. We don't know where she's going, you know, 20 years down the road, but she's never going to forget this experience. So it is a great cross-cultural program. The literary arts have also been receiving a lot of attention on campus lately with a recent jazz poetry night and the printing of a number of student publications. I flare my nose into the wind and sucked up. I suck up my 17 essential toxins and dioxins. Uh, ben went well, they always go well. I've put on a few before. Um, and I just, they're so easy to put on. And the, it's just nice to have something up here that's not a dance or you know, the, the sort of generic student events up here, and I think the university is about putting on events that uh, perhaps you wouldn't find here usually. I think it's only getting better, <laughs> and we have tons and tons of opportunities to get exposure. And sort of, I think that's what we're all trying to do, and yeah. that's, um, Experiment in Transit is just sort of a student newspaper for an escape, um, for people just to, to get out, and especially people who aren't necessarily involved with, with um, arts at UMBC, mm -hmm. or even in the community and to get their work out and, and do stuff that, that interests them and interests people. Yeah, well, we've had a lot of student response. We put out uh, Static last year, uh, which is a collection of students from every department, um, and it was a huge success. Putting another one out this year, uh, which will be uh, Static Part 2, uh, which we've already gotten more entries than we've ever had before. We think that it has a lot of potential, and I think potential is very underrated. And this is a happy poem, and happy is also very underrated. It's called Light and Close Acquaintances. I'd never been to a poetry reading before I came up here, and I was in Vancouver. And then someone forced me to be in one, and I had such a great time now in putting them on. And I think, really, my involvement with putting on jazz nights and, and poetry nights and trying other things has essentially made me the person I am. I mean, I, maybe it's not a good person, but uh, it, it's made me, it, it, I think it's solidified my character. It's built. I came here and I was pretty rough and, and university has sort of made me the person I want to be and, and I think a lot of that is the culture and trying new things and, and having and university allowing me and making it easy for me to put on events that make me, you know, that have really made university worth going to. Beyond my degree, I think the, the culture that we have helped create here has been one of the most important things in my life to this point. I saw your legs today in the hallway, damn. <laughs> Thousands of grade 12 students are now on the home stretch towards the culmination of their high school careers. Many are now looking ahead to a university, as are many college students who are looking to apply the results of their two-year diploma program towards the completion of a four-year bachelor's degree. Whatever the case, the student body at UNBC has more than doubled since 1994 and now sits at 3,000 students. Part of that growth is due to an active campaign to make prospective students more aware of UNBC and the opportunities that exist here. Spotlight on UNBC is part of that program, but a special video has been produced and is shown to high school and college students across the country showing UNBC 
and what this university is all about. The students always come into a university, bring life into a university, make it their university, and uh, at a new university you have much more opportunity to do that than at an established university where you kind of slot it into uh, to a pattern. So I mean, we're still developing our traditions, we're still developing our style of interaction, we're still developing our student programs. I mean, there's so much opportunity for students uh, with real imagination, creativity, and uh, energy to get involved and, and do something and learn in the process, learn life skills in the process. My experience was much like the students uh, here. Uh, I had young faculty members. Faculty members said, call me by my first name. And UNBC is very informal and very open. And most professors, including me, I mean, I'm the vice president, but most of the students who come to see me call me Deb. And I think that's good. I mean, I know I've got a doctorate. I know I've got a PhD. I need it to keep my job. But to have a kind of open and informal communication, which I was lucky enough to experience in my first degree, um, I think it's, a, it's critical. It's, it makes your learning experience intimate and informal and engaging. And, and I was lucky enough to have that experience, and students who come here are lucky enough to have that experience. There are a lot of people who've argued that you can explain their effects through attributional mechanisms. Right, you that, can. Yeah. So it's yeah. got to be an exchange of information. It isn't just about me standing in front of the class and pretending to be delivering the truth. It's about me suggesting a number of possible explanations, interpretations, or alternatives on any range of concerns, and then saying to you as a student, what do you think? Thinking of things maybe like you never thought of them before, looking at them in ways maybe you never quite l looked at them before. And very importantly, get your ideas out. And again, no idea is a dumb idea except the idea that didn't get put for consideration. Would you like to share with the class what you think is your most unique? Personal quotations, <laughs> Good. Hey, this is excellent. Faculty are willing to do exciting or creative things. One of our most interesting courses, and we actually had two courses like that this summer. Uh, we have one at Barkerville that's local history, and it happens in, in a live historical museum, an outdoor museum. We have a number of exchanges. Students have the possibility to go to Russia, and Russian students are coming here. Coming from this, uh, from Fort St. James, uh, and I really wanted to see what else there was out there, and th the exchange program gives you that opportunity. For me, as a First Nations student, it was the culture to meet th another Indigenous group and just to exchange information, because there's a lot of similarities between, between us. So I'm a forestry student at UNBC. I'm, in the, I'm actually in the co-op education program, which is a, a, a combination of work terms and academic terms. So I'm working for a forest consultant this summer in Prince George, and I'm doing silviculture work. What the university does, it just gives you the tools, like the basic, what you need, and then you go out there and you apply what you've learned. And this is when you really understand, you know, what's going on and what's happening. Uh, before that, you, you don't really know. You think you do, but un until you get out there, then you're like, oh, really? This is the way it works, you know? Like, it's totally different. We have programs throughout northern British Columbia. We have teaching centers in the northwest, in the Peace River District, and in the south central. And at these locations, we teach both in a face-to-face -face format and through distance ed. And it also allows us to take advantage of the knowledge and the expertise of our partners, the local colleges. I've been in the North most of my life, and uh, it's just beautiful country. And it goes so well with my normal lifestyle of out in the trees, camping, hiking, fishing. I do lots of fishing. I'm so close to it in Prince George that uh, it works well for my life. I 
I don't think Prince George is really promoted or people really fully understand what you can do. I mean, and the opportunities that we have. I mean, you're right in the middle of the wilderness here. I mean, there's so much to do. There's so much outdoor activities. And that's why I'm glad I came here. And that's why I'm going to stay here is because there's so much to do outdoors. I think the one thing I remember most about the experience living in residence is uh, the people I live with. Because in the buildings, 24 hours a day, you can talk to anybody. You wake up in the middle of the night, you, you know, you need to talk to somebody. You can go anywhere, up and down the halls, and there's lots of people. There's lots of action. Uh, there's lots of stuff going on. Um, and you meet different people in different angles, and you're able to... Um, sort of start fresh and meet people and not really care what their last name was but know they enjoy you know reading books and if they read a book you have to do a report on you can go see you can go talk to them at two o'clock in the morning my neighbor is just a pro at physics so i can go over to him and get help and i can go across the hall and make sure that my answers for the chem problem set are like you know reasonable and that kind of thing and you need to study and you don't have to get off the hill or you don't have to go somewhere else to study you can just walk down the hall and there's someone in your class. A new university attracts people of adventurous spirit, people who have the strength to say, we're going to step away from tradition here. We're going to try a new way of doing this. I think we are so lucky to have the faculty that we have here. They're, they really care about the students. They really care about what we do, what we're going to do after we're done and we're finished here. And um, the friends, too. And we're just such a, a, a different group of people from all over Canada and all over the world. Well, the highlight of, of my time, I guess, was, was being involved with a lot of interesting people many of whom are still my friends. And they're ambassadors, they're company presidents, they're school teachers, they're you name it. We formed friendships in that first year that last us a life, will last us a lifetime. And that's what it is. They're, you get to know interesting people. And to me, that was the highlight, uh, that, that I not only studied, but I had people to talk to about what I was learning, what I was interested in. And uh, to me, that is the essence of a university, is community. It's very positive. UNBC has been a wonderful experience for me as a student, and I've been to the institutions, enjoyed them, had a lot of experiences. But UNBC is unique and pretty special for me. Thanks for watching this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. Next month, we're planning a full length report on how UNBC research and teaching can be applied to the pressing social, environmental, and economic concerns of the North. You'll see the diverse range of activities and how UNBC research can really be applied to improving the quality of life in Northern BC. All that and more is coming up next month.